Okay, sounds good. So hello everyone. Uh, I am Oscar Huang. I'm a graduate student at Texas A&M University and uh, under the supervision of Dr. Miladin Radovich. And this project is also a collaboration uh, with our collaborators at Louisiana State University. Um, so yeah, so the title of this presentation is the feasibility study of metacalum based geopolymer as binder for construction mortar. So a um, little overview, what we were trying to achieve in, uh, in this project is to investigate the effect of geopolymer composition on important properties such as compressive strength, density, open porosity, um, in order for geopolymer to be considered as the binder for construction mortar. Uh, why is this important? Because geopolymer is a, a promising candidate for replacing ordinary Portland cement since uh, many research has shown that uh, geopolymer has properties that are similar or superior to Portland cement. And during the production process, it has a much lower carbon footprint since we can utilize uh, waste material or um, natural materials or local source material um, to synthesize this material. <clears throat> so a little bit of a background for geopolymer. Um, there are a couple components that makes up geopolymer. We, uh, I would say the most important one is the aluminosilicate source. Uh, in this case, that uh, some of the examples are metacalin, fly ash, furnace slag, rice husk, volcanic ash. Uh, the reason that we're choosing metacalin is because metacalin is a uh, relatively pure source of uh, aluminum silicate in the case of the metacalin that we're using. Um, it has less than 5% of impurity. Uh, as opposed to fly ash or furnace slag, it usually has, uh, you know, uh, various impurities such as magnesium hydrogen a magnesium oxide, calcium oxide, and that depending on where you source it from, the composition can vary, which means that it will be difficult to reproduce. It might be difficult to reproduce the results um, depending on where you get your fly ash or furnace like from. Um, for uh, the alkali hydroxide, we are using sodium and potassium and that uh, we, um, to, uh, vary the silicon to aluminum ratio, which is one of the parameters that we're looking for. We have chosen to use silica fuel, since if we were to use sodium or potassium silicate, that uh, when we increase the silicon to aluminum ratio, um, it can also increase the amount of alkali that's in the system, which makes it you know a little more complicated when we're dealing with you know increasing the ratio. And similar to Portland cement, water to solids ratio is also important, that it will influence the uh, curing time, the setting time, as well as the workability of the fresh paste. So uh, when we're uh, synthesizing geopolymer, we start with the aluminum silicate source. We uh, add that into our activating solution, which contains dissolved alkali hydroxide, as well as silica fume if needed. And then during the gelation process, which means uh, when, okay, so back up a little bit. So when the aluminum silicate source is added into the activating solution, it is dissolved into various uh, polymeric and oligomeric uh, silicon aluminum species. And that as, as they recombine with each other, as the polymer and oligomer recombine with each other, they start forming longer and longer chain. This is what we call first step of gelation. And during this process, the water that was first absorbed during the dissolution process is now uh, being released again. And as the chain grows longer and longer, so this is the curing process, more and more water is released until we have a three-dimensional um, uh, polymeric chain of geopolymer. So the naming convention that we'll be using throughout this presentation is, you can see it from the right here. Um, so we say that there are four main uh, chemical composition factors when we're looking at geopolymer. We have the activator cation, we have the silicon to aluminum ratio, the water to solids ratio, and the cation to aluminum ratio. 
And uh, you can also see on the left here, it can also be uh, represented in the, in the form of a chemical formula. So, right, okay, so I will continue here. Okay, so um, we have looked at a lot of different compositions here. We are looking at a total of 16 compositions and focusing primarily on the effect of silicon aluminum ratio and water solids ratio. And the table on the right here uh, kind of shows that uh, what kind of compositions we're looking at. So in this case, uh, right here, we have the K. So we have the potassium 231 and the sodium 241. And the reason that we're we keep up here the cation to aluminum ratio to one is because the cation is actually balancing the negative charge from the aluminum. So in this case, we're not really interested in playing with that ratio too much. And so we're trying to keep it at one. And as for the curing conditions, all the samples are cured at ambient temperature with the first seven days under a sealed environment and then another seven days under open environment. So the synthesis process, um, so I'll just kind of give you a different view with pictures of uh, our process in the lab here. Uh, we start with you know, water and dissolving either sodium or potassium hydroxide into the water. And then if needed, we're adding silica fume into that as well. And that will form our activator solution. And then when we add that uh, into our metacalin, or rather we add the metacalin into our activator solution, into our uh, shear mixing machine, uh, vacuum shear mixing machine, actually. And the reason we're doing that is because uh, when uh, during the mixing process, we can mix a lot of bubbles into the paste. So if it's under a vacuum environment, then it's, it will be more difficult to actually mix air bubbles into the paste. And shear mixing has been uh, approved by the community that is the best way to make geopolymers. <clears throat> and then we are also using sand that are uh, in accordance to the C ASTM C778. And then after we pour the uh, geopolymer paste or mortar into our uh, mold. We vibrate it and cure for 14 days. And here's a picture of our geopolymer binder or paste sample and the geopolymer mortar sample. So now we're taking a look at the results of our pure geopolymer results, uh, the strength of our pure geopolymer. So here we have you know, two compositions that have the same silicon to lunar ratio, but vary in water solids ratio. And that's this repeats. So we have the sodium on the left here and potassium on the right. So as a general trend, we kind of see, as, at least for the sodium, that increasing in the silicon to lunar ratio increases the strength. And that when we are increasing the water ratio, so it's, for example, from 241 to 251, or if we're looking at from 421 to 431, we see a significant drop in strength and this is because, you know, as we add more water into the geopolymer, the, the, ge the sample become more porous, therefore it has less strength. That's very similar to the Portland cement. Um, but we do see a very interesting trend of the silicon to aluminum ratio affecting the strength significantly. Um, for, for the potassium here, it doesn't have a clear trend. Um, it kind of just levels off at roughly 15 megapascal. Uh, as soon as we increase it 2.5 and, you know, doesn't have much of a impact uh, even when we increase it to four. Um, uh, one interesting note is that you can see uh, for sodium 321 and 331, as well as potassium 321 and 331, we do see a reverse trend compared to the other samples. And that's because that um, the 321s are much more viscous uh, to the point, they're very, very viscous to the point that it's almost unworkable. So they set very quickly, which makes the uh, sample very, very porous and have a lot of entrapped air into it, which makes them very weak despite being very dense. <clears throat> so we have also taken results from a previous student that has graduated in our group, uh, um, Dr. Liz Cano. Um, she did her thesis on elevated curing of metacalin-based geopolymer. So she cured all her samples at 60 degrees 
as opposed to uh, ambient temperature. And as you can see that the elevated curing geopolymer actually achieved much, much higher strength. So in the case, especially in the case of sodium-421, potassium-421, you can see they reach strength of above 70 megapascal to the point of even like close to 90 megapascal here. Um, so uh, what we're thinking is that actually 14-day curing is a very low, very short period of amount of time. And this is kind of showing the potential of geopolymer, medicalin-based geopolymer, how strong they could be uh, if we were to, you know, maybe if we were able to cure them properly and to cure them for long enough. And this is actually what something we're working on right now um, to figure out how to achieve this level of strength while curing at ambient temperature. So now we're looking at the mortar samples. So these are the samples where we added sand into uh, our geopolymer paste samples. And I have uh, added the different types of uh, uh, mortar strength according to ASTM standard onto the chart. So you can kind of get an idea of um, how they are compared to the ASTM standard. So as a general trend that Again, that increasing silicon to lunar ratio does increase the strain significantly. Um, and that as long as we are above 2.5 for both sodium and potassium, we have a strength of re, uh, being better than M-type mortars. And that, um, you know, not adding any silicon, additional silicon to lunar, uh, additional silicon, um, gives us very poor strength. Um, however, we don't see you know, the similar kind of trend that we see uh, with the pure geopolymer sample. Um, in this case, like us, um, for the sodium, that if we have silicon to lumen ratio above three, that we kind of just see the strength leveling up at roughly like you know, 35 megapascal. So we're kind of comparing, you know, how the geopolymer, how the geopolymer behaves after we add sand, before we add sand. So the red bars here are the geopolymer paste samples, while the blue bars here are the geopolymer mortar samples. And specifically, we're looking at the sodium compositions here. So as you can see that overall, uh, that when we add sand into geopolymer, the strength increases significantly. <coughs> um, so in a way, we're thinking that, you know, when we add sand into the geopolymer, it actually kind of um, strengthens the binder. And, you know, we kind of want to find out why this is happening. So um, we did some more tests. We did open porosity, um, looking at, uh, more, we measure the open porosity and density. Um, we see that this right here, the potassium-231 is um, not, a part of the trend. So as we increase in density, we're kind of expecting the open porosity to go down. And um, when we look at the mortars here, we kind of see all the samples clumping right here. That's because, you know, mortar has is mostly sand in this case. But we do see the so potassium-231 kind of being a, a outlier again. <clears throat> when we look at the strength versus density, we are expecting the strength to increase as we increase in density, right? So as the sample is denser, strength should increase. However, we do see a kind of an inverse parabola here. Interestingly, that around 1.5, 1.6 grams per centimeter cube is the optimal density. So if we look at the outlier points, we do have the uh, sodium-321 and the potassium-231 again. So as you may recall, the sodium-321 is the sample that didn't cure properly and was too, too thick to be uh, mixed properly. And as for you know, the mortar and strength, uh, our mortar doesn't give us much of a, um, much to analyze here. Um, so then you know, we started this look into the uh, morphology, micromorphology of these samples. So we have the SEM of the potassium-231 here. Um, so we have the sand, you know, what the, geo, the binder phase and the sand. 
So we can see here that the, the binder is very uh, heterogeneous, meaning we have you know, different colors here. So we have the darker phase and the wider phase. So when we look at the lighter phase, we can see this uh, uh, stacked plate-like structure. We are uh, very optimistic that this is the metakiln forming here. You can see this, you know, metakiln-like uh, kiln structure here. So, you know, being K231, potassium-231 being the outlier is most likely due to the fact that um, the geopolymer didn't uh, polymer, geopolymerize at all, and there are a lot of unreacted metakiln left in the, in the binder. So when we look at one of the better samples, better performing sample here, we have the sodium-421 that when we look, take a closer look at the geopolymer binder, that we have much less amount of uh, unreacted metakiln, you know. And then when we look at some of our uh, better perform, some of our other samples as well, uh, I do want to point out that the potassium-331, potassium-321, we can see a very good wetting of the surface on the sand uh, by the geopolymer. And we're thinking that, you know, this good wetting of the surface uh, and this good ITZ uh, is most likely a good contributor to uh, the, the significant increase in the strength from the pure to the mortar samples. So to conclude, uh, we believe that geopolymer mortars is a viable uh, replacement for Portland cement mortars. Uh, some of the best ambient cure geopolymer paste has a strength of 15, 20 megapascal, while elevated cure geopolymer paste can go up to 90 megapascal. Um, geopolymer, mor uh, mortar, uh, geopolymer binders have optimum density of roughly 1.6 gram centimeter cube. Adding sand significantly increases the strain most likely due to a good ITZ, and that uh, the amount of unreacted metakiln significantly affects the properties of our geopolymer binder. So I would like to acknowledge Chenset for you know, providing a grant and the chance to work on this interesting project. Uh, materials characterization facility at Texas A&M for their uh, SEM uh, equipment as well as BSF for providing um, the medicaline. Thank you for listening and yeah, that's it for my presentation.